first time, life together, first time. Oh, thank you. Where were y'all last month? That's right. No. Oh, that was so cute. Clap for them. They wanted to clap. <laughs> Girl, you're in the same place. This is one thing that I've said about women's ministry here at Green Acres. This is a this is a safe place to share, and this is a great place to grow. And you have come to a great place today, whether you had to fight the devil, anybody but me had to fight the devil to get here today. I've heard several of your stories. You're like, I've been here lives the devil. I'm gonna be in a seat in life together today. I felt the same way. I got up this morning. My phone didn't work. Brand new phone. The iPhone 10 didn't work. And all kind of crazy going on. But I know this. That the Lord has a word for us. For me. And we're going to get in God's word together. We're going to see what principles we can pull out. What life lessons we can apply to our lives and our circumstances. And I love nothing more. No place I guess. I'd rather be than with a group of women having their Bibles open, trying to trying to hear God speak to them about what they're going through. So we have a lot to cover, and I try to be respectful of your time. We'll try to start right at 12, and I'm going to have to let you go at 1, and I'm not sure why I'm going to teach to an empty table today, but um, whoever comes in late is going to be front and center, apparently. So let me hit a few high points, please, and um, announcements, and then I want us to pray and ask the Lord to be right here in the middle of us. Oh, well, not yet. Y'all are so, see, y'all are so cute. Already hold hands. Let's pray. Let's get on with it. Get on with it. Let me give you the announcements first. Let me let me do a welcome. I, I failed to even introduce myself. I was so excited. Uh, I'm Debbie Stewart, and it is my great pleasure and privilege of a lifetime to lead the women here as the women's minister at Green Acres. And let me just say this on a side note. I, I begin, some of you have heard me say this, I've been in ministry for 27 years. I started when I was 12, and so 27 years, I've never been more excited about ministry as I am right here, right now with you. I, I, I cannot put to words how quick of a connection the Lord has created between us. I hope you feel that way too. Maybe it's just me. But I, I feel like the Lord has given us this quick connection and we have fast-tracked some friendship and relationship. And I believe that's because He's got some things planned for us. And um, I'm so glad we're in this together. So thank you for the privilege of serving you in that way. So I, I'm the director. Jamie Cornelius is in the back. Jamie, raise your hand. Assistant Women's Ministry Leader. Not, yes, please. Y'all are so sweet to encourage the Right next to her, you'll see Emily Adams. She's our new director of communications. And the brains behind the operations in the hallway. Mimi Youngblood makes all this stuff happen in an unusual way. And I'm very, very thankful for my team. <clears throat> so when you walk outside, if you'll drop your name tags back off. But I also want you to know that there is a sign-up sheet to join our prayer team. I hope that you will do that. And here's one reason. The, the prayer team is because prayers, uh, above all that we do, prayer is going to be the most important thing. I think it was Oswald Chambers that said, prayer does not equip us for greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And I need a prayer team. And this afternoon, before I leave town, I'm actually leaving very early in the morning to fly to Bellingham, Washington. I'm going to go do a conference there, and then I'm going to stay over a few days to see my sweet grandsons, my, my, my daughter and son-in-law, too. Them, too. But, <laughs> But for sure, I'm going to have some hands on some little boys. You need to know that. So I'm going to do that. But I'm telling you this. Before I leave today, I'm sending out a prayer. I'm sending out a prayer email to that prayer team. I need you to get on it today. Because I'm asking for a very, very special, personal prayer request of something that's going to happen here at Green Acres that, to my knowledge, has never happened in the history of Green Acres before. And I need you to be praying about it. Okay, we do that, so sign up for that prayer team. That's my inside track. You want to know what's going on? You have to begin on prayer team because my whole thing is like, our, let's just pray about this as we get going. Also, you might help us be a liaison in your Sunday morning Bible study class. Raise your hand if you're a liaison. Oh, thank you. Yeah, clap for them too. Go ahead. I love my liaisons. Thank you. Many of you are here today because we had a liaison in your class that said, you need to come to this. We'll save you a seat. Let's our class sit together. And that's exactly the reason for that. So thank you for helping us to communicate and do what our pastor has said this year, our theme for Green Acres. What is our word? Okay. Connect. This is an opportunity for us to connect with one another and also connect around God's word. We call it life together because we want to do life together. It's based on Romans 1.12 that we might be mutually strengthened, encouraged, and comforted by each other's faith. 
both yours and mine. That's the verse that we found in this on, so that we can connect. And then also this week, the Lord has been stirring in my heart, just stirring me up about a scripture I came across in my Bible study time that also has to do with this. Because as you can see, there are some seats that, that should be filled. We, we have some empty seats here. Maybe you're thinking of someone that could benefit from this kind of friendship and this kind of gathering to do life together. It's found in 1 Samuel 23, 16. And three words the Lord just drilled into my heart. The Bible says this in 23, 16 about Jonathan. It said, Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. You know what three words the Lord drilled to me? Went to find. Jonathan went to find David so he could encourage him to be strong in his faith. I'm going to challenge us that we go and find some women who maybe we've, we've, we've seen. They used to be here. We don't know what happened. I assure you something happened. And if we could just reach out to them, I think that would be a huge blessing. Okay, so welcome, welcome, welcome to Life Together. Our subtitle is A Spiritual Growth Through Friendship. All right, now, well, would you reach out and touch the hand of the sweet girl next to you? Don't make her hold hands if she doesn't want to. Just touch her on the elbow. Don't be weird. I need you to ask the Lord that he will speak to us. You know, the Bible says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I, we need to hear from the Lord today. We're not here to hear a person or personality or anything. We, we really need, God's Word says, when you open up his Word, the unfolding of his Word gives light. We need, let's, let's light this place up today, okay? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray just uh, that you will calm my spirit and give me the, the divine ability and a special anointing pleased today to communicate to these sweet girls what's on the pages of your word, things that you want us to know. I know that there are things, there are lessons, there's some principles, there's some promises here you want to drive home. And only you can do that. And only at the, through the power at work in a life could any of us even receive that. And I'm asking you today for breakthrough. And I'm asking you for revelation. I'm asking you to release some women from captivity. I'm asking that you would comfort some women today. I'm praying that you would direct some that have nothing but questions. They're at the crossroad. I'm asking you to redirect some that have gone off on a wrong path. I pray today is the day that they get back in line with what you're trying to accomplish in their life. Lord, in this moment, as their leader, I just want to speak to us. I want to speak on behalf of us and say, we, we humble ourselves before you. and We will obey. We will listen. And we will obey. So, Lord, I pray that you would equip us to do that. It's easy to say, just like the man in, in your word said, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. So, Lord, as we open this up, with just, the, just the instruction from the heart of God just fall on us afresh and anew. Uh, we are your maid servants. Let it be as you desire. And all the girls said, Amen. 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 Thank you. You have a handout. And if you will turn in your Bibles, please, to uh, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 is a story you're probably familiar with, but we're going to ask the Lord to give us a fresh look at this. It's about the Israelites. We're going to see what lessons that we can learn. Now, before we pick up in 15, we're going to really be in 16. I want us to go back for just a moment to uh, Exodus 14. If you'll get there. This is the Israelites, and they had faced the impossible situation, the Red Sea. They had been released from captivity. And they did not know what to do, and the Lord wanted them to proceed. But they could not see how to do that in the situation. So from the Lord's miraculous intervention, they, they obviously this place found themselves kind of an unexpected place. The Lord performed a miracle and allowed them to walk through, if you will, the very problem that they faced. Now, just go back to chapter 14. Let me hit a couple of highlights so that I'm not taking anything out of context. We're not going to jerk a verse here today. We're just going to try to keep it all in line with what's going on. You know, a verse away is not going to keep the devil away, okay? So we got to figure out what the whole thing is trying to say to us, the whole counsel of God's Word. So in chapter 14, they came out of, out of captivity and they got to the Red Sea. And here, this is so cute. I love this verse in 14, Exodus 14, 14. I have quoted this verse for years. And, and, I, and it says this, keep silent and the Lord will fight for you. I've taken that out of context so many times. It's not even funny. Keep silent, the Lord will fight for you. If I'm mad at my husband, I'm like, keep silent, the Lord will fight for you. He will fight for you. Okay, well, you know, no, not, not really. And then it's an interesting thing because that's what Moses, and picture this, when we're in God's Word, I need you to engage. I need you to put yourself in this story. I need you to be looking at the Red Sea. 
So they come right up to the Red Sea, and Moses is saying to the people, basically, I'm paraphrasing, not reading right now. He's saying to the people, um, we're, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, and he's saying, keep, keep, the, the Lord will fight for us. Just We're right here because they couldn't go any further. So he's like, just stand still. Matter of fact, let me read exactly what he says. He says, uh, don't be afraid, verse 13. Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand where you are and watch the Lord rescue you. The Egyptians that you see today, you will never see again. Verse 14, the Lord himself will fight for you. You won't have to lift a finger in your defense. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but the other translation said the Lord will fight for you. But it's all good and, and, and great to say it except for, except for the very next verse. You know what the very next verse is? So that's what Moses said to the people, verse 15, and then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to move forward. Get moving. Anybody else see that the Lord didn't say stand still and see the salvation of the Lord? That's what Moses said. The Lord's like, ah, get moving. But in his defense, obviously, they're standing at the Red Sea. So how are they going to get moving? So he was going to say he wanted them to have faith that the Lord was getting ready to do something, and he did. And then we get to the end of chapter 14 of Exodus. And here's what they say, verse 29. Here's what the people said. The people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry land as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. Picture. This is how the Lord rescued Israel from the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites could see the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the shore. And when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had displayed against the Egyptians... They feared the Lord and they put their faith in Him and in His servant Moses. Remember that scripture. Chapter 15 comes. If you'll see, it's a song of deliverance. You might have a heading. Most of chapter 15, you'll see all of that little, see it's lined up like a little poem, as you will, or all of their song. All of those scriptures, how many of them? Uh, 20 of them are all about... The Israelites now on the other side praising the Lord. They're dancing in their deliverance. They're having the time and they're like, we trust the Lord. We're putting our faith in God. It's like, yay God, boo devil. We're going this thing with God. I mean, we're all in. All of these wonderful things that they promised to the Lord because of their deliverance. And so all of those scriptures come and you would think and they lived happily ever after. Boy, it's, it, it's easy to sing when the circumstances are good, isn't it? Then we get to verse 21. The Bible says this. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved into the sure desert, or your ver version might say the wilderness. And they traveled there in this desert for three days without water. And when they came to Myra, they finally found water, but the people couldn't drink because it was bitter. That is why the place was called Myra, which means bitter water. And I want to ask you a question. Let's just let that fall on us for a second. Um, you know, they're at this place and now they're all happy. They're like, oh, we love it over here. They're like, oh, we love this place. We love this place. And then they get to the desert and they're going through for three days and they're getting hungry. They're getting thirsty. There's no water to drink. They're like, we hate this place. We hate this place. You know, we now, now they're whining in the wilderness. They were dancing in deliverance. Now they're whining in the wilderness. But a principle that I don't want us to miss is the very, that very uh, verse in 21. It says that the Lord led them. Here's a little life lesson for you. You can be in the middle of the wilderness and still be in the middle of God's will for your life. Because the Bible said God led them to that place. And they liked it there. And their deliverance. Verse 22 says that when He led them to the wilderness. And so they follow through. And so when you're in the wilderness, you can know that you're in the will of God. Now, don't confuse that with when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They wandered in the wilderness because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion, because of their unbelief. So don't confuse God leading you to the wilderness with your own stubborn decisions that land you in the wilderness. So if you're in a wilderness season in your life right now, you might want to do a little check. Why, why did you land there? Did the Lord lead you there? Or did you lead yourself there because of what's happened? There was a time in my life when I left Prestonwood. I don't have time to go into this whole story. When the Lord called me away from Prestonwood Baptist Church. I was on staff there for 10 years. Loved it. Everything was going great. There wasn't a reason in the world for me to leave that place. We were having a ball. But when the Lord says go, girl, you got one decision. And the Lord led me to women of faith for a two-year period of time. 
And before I ever stepped foot in the front door of Women of Faith, I, the Lord had already let me know in my heart, this is going to be your wilderness season. This can be your wilderness season. And at first I was like, oh, bummer. Like, this is not going to be any fun. I'm, now now I'm gonna, it's going to be a dry place. I'm going to be on the shelf. I'm not going to be used. I, I just hate the wilderness. I hate going to the wilderness. I had a total misconception of what the wilderness was about. I don't know if y'all get like that. Oh, the wilderness is going to be a time. It's not, not anything going to be going. That's not true at all. There were five things the Lord wanted to do that we're going to see. And he, wanted, he took them to the wilderness to do it. When he says, let's go to the wilderness, y'all be excited because y'all up there, he's going to get ready to do something, unlike what I previously thought. So now it's like when the Lord says, go to the wilderness, you say, yay, let's go to the wilderness. <laughs> said, no one ever. I know. I know y'all don't want to go there either. I know. We say we will, but we, I know y'all. I know y'all already. I still got your number already. But, but he, he led them there. But now let me ask you this question. Just think. think just think on God's word for a little bit. Why? After their deliverance, would he bring thirsty people to water that they cannot drink? Any, anybody just think like that when you're looking? Like, why bring them? At the end of this, I'm going to close with, with uh, just a personal story of the biggest mistake in my relationship and in my walk with the Lord. There is one big mistake that I continue to make, apparently, over and over. And the Lord has said to me, He's been very clear to me, this is going to stop. This little thing that you do is going to stop. And it is played out right here in Scripture. And you may be doing it as well. I didn't even know it was a mistake until I saw it in Scripture. So be thinking through this. So think through. Anybody want to give some thought? Why does the Lord bring thirsty people to water that they can't drink? You know, for me, I'm like, why even introduce water? I mean, if nobody's going to drink anyway, I mean, just why even show them this pond of water? Think about it. If anybody wants to answer, I'd love to hear that. I also want you to think about this. Um... I might have to read one more. I want to read the next sentence before I ask the second question. Verse 24. So they're at Myra. It's bitter, and they can't drink it. Verse 24. Then the people turned against Moses. What are we going to drink, they demanded. Okay, now, now think, think. What did we just read in chapter 14, 31? They feared the Lord and put their faith in Him and His servant Moses. How many days did it take them to change from faith, fear the Lord and faith in Him and faith in Moses? How many days did it take them to change their mind about that? Thank you. Three days, Michelle. That's exactly three days. That, that, I, I, I'm giving them a run for their money. It takes them about a week, but they got they gave me three days. They got they got about three days. Now the whole attitude has changed. Their whole perspective has changed. So two questions I want you to think about: Why does He bring us to water we can't drink? And then. After the big miraculous thing that they just saw with the Lord that also had to do with water, do you think it crossed anyone's mind? Uh, we just saw this huge thing with the Red Sea. I'm pretty sure a little pond of water here is not going to be a big deal for him to do something. Well, how did this get lost? So any thoughts about why the Lord brings us to water we can't drink? Yeah. Good. Hey, hey. You're so right because I think they brought them up here to say, what, what are they going to do? What, what will they do? Is it true that they put their faith in me and they feared me and they, and they put their faith in my, my servant? Let's see. Let's see. Good. Yes. To trust him. Good. What else? Any other thoughts? Once Has he ever done that to you? Brings you to a place you thought it was going to be a certain way and it's not that way at all. Why? Well, let's go on and, and let's let the Lord answer that on the pages of his word. Which, which, what I love about this is sometimes when we're asking God's question, we don't know. We, we, we may not know this side of heaven. But in this circumstance, in this situation, he answers it. He lets you know exactly why he did it. And I love that because that's going to be helpful to us. It goes on to say in verse 25, So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a branch. And Moses took the branch and threw it in the water. Picture it, picture it. Saw a stick. This made the water good to drink. It was there at Mara that the Lord laid before them the following conditions to what? Say it out loud. To what? Test their faithfulness. Say it with me. Test their faithfulness. There's your why right there. To test their faithfulness. Verse 26. If you will listen carefully. Turn to your girlfriend and say, girl, listen carefully. 
Listen carefully. If you're in my five habits of a woman who doesn't quit, we've been hounding, hounding our listening skills about listen carefully. If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, obeying His commands and laws, then I will not make you suffer the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And then I love this. After leaving Mara, they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees. See, they keep having this issue with water. You see, they keep coming up the Red Sea, then that's it. And now at the end, when, when the Lord brought them out, He not only provided, changed that water, He provided springs. He provided springs for really one for every tribe, if you will. And palm trees to boot. They never asked for palm trees. We don't need palm trees. He blessed them with the shade of those palm trees, even when they did not respond correctly to them. Okay, I want to see what, what lessons we can pull out of this for just a second as we get back to the story. I think they love the place and they hate the place and they love the place. Let's see what five things uh, we can learn that the Lord does in the wilderness. I think I've already mentioned your two life lessons. God led them to the wilderness. You can be in the middle of the wilderness and still be in the middle of God's will for your life. I don't think I said the second one. For them, the wilderness was the way to get where God was taking them from to where God was taking them to. Sometimes in our spiritual journey, the Lord needs you, desires for you. It's necessary for you to go through the wilderness. So let's learn not to forfeit it and not to dread it. Okay? Um, what's the first one? You, you're smart. Well, let's figure this out together. God wanted to what something? Test. That's exactly right. God wanted to test something. That's one of the reasons for the wilderness. What did He want to test? Write it in. Their faithfulness. We're going to have to look a little further for the next one. I want you to see this. What's the second reason? God wanted to, to blank them something. Can you see it? What's, the first, what's like the very next thing that happened? Show. Let me give you the word show. God wanted to show him something. Wanted to show them. And... We find that where it says, and Moses cried out to the Lord, and maybe you want to underline this in your Bible, at least this is the translation that I have, and the Lord showed him a branch. This is why I think this is important, showed. Because the Bible could have just said, the Lord told him to pick up the branch, or the stick, or whatever your law, whatever your translation might say. But I think it was important that the Lord brought in that little extra work. He showed it to him. Before he told him what to do with it, he showed it to him. And this is why I think, this is, this is I'm so visual person, this is what came to my mind. If there were a big stick right here on this stage, several of us would have walked in and go, what is that stick doing? We don't need that stick. We would throw it in. We would throw it in the trash. We would throw it out. We would remove it. I mean, that's not good for me. That's trash. Let's get that out of here. We don't need that here. I think one of the reasons, or maybe it was just me, probably just me, he showed Moses something that everybody else would have said, there's nothing good coming out of that. What, 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 what good is a stick for? He used something, didn't use his staff. He could have used his staff, as he has many other times in his word. He did not use his staff. He used something that others would have thrown away, that would have said, this is not important, there's no use in this, it's no good. I'm telling you something, I've had some things in my life that I have labeled, I have labeled that is useless, not a thing in the world. There's nothing but something bad, and there's nothing good can come out of that. And sometimes in the wilderness, the Lord wants to show you, I want to use something that you have not looked at that can be useful to me. Are you with me? Am I making too much of a stretch for you? Maybe it was just me. But he made my eyeballs fall on something that I had failed to see as useful to him in my past. Okay? So show, I think, was an important word. The next one is this. The Bible says he showed him a branch and Moses took it through the water. So he instructed Moses. He wanted to tell him something. He wanted to test something. He wanted to show them, him something. He wanted to tell him something. He then told him how to use the branch. Throw it in the water. He wanted to show him. Matter of fact, I want to tell you this one little thing about show. One more, I failed to mention this. When you look this word up in the original language, and this is why looking words up in the original language are so important. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and the New Testament is written in Greek, and there's some Aramaic in there, but mainly. So that, so that we're in the Old Testament, so a heap that was written in Hebrew, and that was translated into our English language. 
And I very much love going back to the Hebrew words. What is the Hebrew word? Because the definitions are so are, are so different. For instance, the word love. I can say in my English language, I love Jesus and I love my husband and I love chocolate. But the truth is, I'm using one word for really three very different meanings. And we can use our little English word show. The Lord wanted to show him something. The Lord showed him a branch. When you look that word up, see, that's, this is the deal. This is what we need to dig a little deeper because we all think we know what the word show means. You know, just show, just show. But when you look it up, the Hebrew word is yara, Y-A-R-A. Write that down. Y-A-Yara. Y-A-R-A. That's the Hebrew word for the word show. Do you know what the definition is? Do you know what it means? In the Hebrew language, Yara means to direct, to teach, or to instruct. So in verse 25 tells us that the Lord showed him a branch. Uh, what is the Lord trying to show you? What is something in your life He's trying to show you? If we put that word Yara there, what is the Lord trying to direct, teach, and instruct you? You follow me? You follow me? Yara. If we drop that word in, it gives it a little bit different meaning. The Lord might want to teach, to direct, to instruct you, and He does so by showing you something. All right, so then He wanted to tell him something, so He gave him some instruction there. And also, let me just say this about the instruction he gave to throw that stick into the water. It probably wasn't the most widely approved solution to their problem. Anybody agree with that? You know, the people are already mad at him because they keep changing his mind. They're already now not speaking to him and they're all frustrated with him. And then what does he do? He takes a stick and throws it in the water. They go, he has lost his mind for sure. He does not even know what he's doing. It's not the clinical answer you would give. It's not the, the psychological, biblically psychological answer. He didn't lay it. He should have laid his hands out and prayed. Everybody should have joined hands around the pool of water. And less that. He did, he did something unusual and, and, and people would not understand that. So it's just interesting. Sometimes the Lord asks us to do that. He threw something in. I'm sure they're like, he has lost his mind for sure. The next thing is this. Uh, Moses uh, took the branch and he threw it in the water and this made the water good to drink. And it was there at Myra that the Lord laid before them the conditions to test their faithfulness if you will listen carefully. So at that place, he also wanted to turn something. He wanted to test something. He wanted to show them something. He wanted to tell them something. Teach them. That's right. He tell them something that everybody else wasn't going to understand. He wanted to turn something. He wanted to turn bitter water into better water. Maybe you're in a bitter circumstance in your life right now. Maybe the things that are going on are bitter to you. What can we do? How can the Lord change that bitter situation or that bitter feelings that you might have towards someone? How can that be turned? I think if we follow through with these five things, we will see that happen perhaps, or at least set ourselves up for that to happen in our life. And then the last is this. It's, ver it's in verse 26, the latter part of 26. I will not make you suffer the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, semicolon, for I am the Lord who heals you. There's something he wants to heal in your life. He wants to test, to show, to tell, to turn, and to heal. Okay, as we just let that fall on us for just a few moments and, and respond to the Lord just in our heart of how we're going to respond in obedience when we go to the wilderness season, I hope that you see there's some important things that need to be done there. Are you listening carefully? Are you following through with the instructions that He's given? Are you obeying? So there are going to be times in our life where we, we, we're praying and we're praying and the prayers get answered one way and we pray the same situation for somebody else and the Lord answers a different way. I want to show you that in Scripture. If you'll flip over to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 shows us, again, another unexpected place where somebody landed somewhere they didn't intend to be. They didn't plan to go there. They didn't want to go there. They didn't want to be there. But this is where the Lord had them go. At least in Exodus... They were in an unexpected place. Here they are again at, at a pool of water that they cannot even drink. Why did the Lord even do it? Well, we found out some reasons. Well, that's the Old Testament. Let's look in the New Testament and find another place. This is 
This we're going to look at two places: Acts 12 and Acts 16. Acts 12, again, let me give you a little context here. Uh, this is the story of Peter, and Peter has been faithful to do some things that the Lord had been asking him to do. Peter, I want you to share the gospel. I want you to share the faith, share the good news. And so he's going to tell everybody these uh, about Jesus and about the good news, and at times he might be he might be going against what the Pharisees have said and what the, what the Sadducees have said and different people. But at this point, Peter is put in prison mainly for doing what the Lord had said for him to do. Peter, if you keep on talking about Jesus, we're going to throw you in jail. Well, I can't help it. I'm going to keep on talking about Jesus. So to jail he goes. Let's pick up there and see what happens. Again, picture it. I'm going to need you to get in that jail cell for a moment. All right. Uh, let's pick up in, for the sake of time, chapter 12, verse 6. He is in an unexpected place. And the Bible says this, the night before Peter was about to be placed on trial, which means he was going to be on trial and probably have his head cut off. That was the general plan in those days of what would happen to you. So this is the night before. So most definitely an unexpected place. He was a, So picture the night before Peter was to be placed on trial. He was asleep, chained between, chained between two soldiers while with others standing guard at the prison gate. Okay, just let me stop right there. Would you just raise your hand right now if the night before you're to be placed on trial and probably have your head cut off, that you would be sound asleep? Can I see your hand, please? please, please. We've got one person in here. Okay. Probably Jan. Probably you would be Jan, but not me. And raise your hand if you're just going to go ahead and pitch a fit the night before all that's happening. Thank you very much. You know, I'm like, why is this happening? I'm trying to get myself out of it. I'm trying to call my buddies. I'm praying to Jesus. I'm doing everything that I can because I don't want that to happen tomorrow. I did what was right. Why am I, why is this going to happen? Hey, Peter, you got to love this dude. He's like, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> sound asleep. How does that happen? He is, I just like, he was sound asleep. Chain, in chain between two guards. Okay, picture. Suddenly, verse 7, everybody say suddenly. <laughs> suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. And the angel tapped him on the side to awaken him and he said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. And then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was really happening. And he goes on to say, you'll have to read this in your own time. He goes back to the place where the people had been praying for him to be released from prison. Do you remember the story? Remember he knocks on the door? Rhoda comes to the door and says, oh, it's Peter. Goes to tell her about Peter. Like, no, it's not Peter. You know, the whole faith thing. There's so much we could unpack in that. I'll let you do that with the Lord. But I want to focus in on just these few verses because he was in an unexpected place for an unknown and even an unfair reason. Uh, but I just find it so funny the way Peter, the way Peter reacted to this angel. First of all, I would not have been sound asleep. Second of all, if an angel suddenly appeared in front of me, you probably with a bright light, you're probably not going to have to knock me on the head to wake me up. This is where I love King James. It said the angel smoked him. Does that mean anybody have King James? I think it's the King James. I think it's the one. It said he smoked him. I like that word. I told my husband the other day, I, I will smoke you. <laughs> I was just kidding. But I, I really like the word smoke. But I just picture it. So here's, here's Peter sound asleep. All of a sudden, bright light, bright light comes on. Uh, there's an angel standing before him. And he has to whack Peter on the head. Like, and then it tells him exactly what it is. He whacks him on the head. And he says, wake up. Wake up. And then he says, get up. Get up. Uh, put your shoes on. Anybody? Listen. And so his, his chains fall off. If I am in prison and a bright angel appears in front of me and my chains fall off, you don't have to tell me to put my sandals on and get help. I will be helped. All right, my stuff. I'll put it on as we go. Okay, let's go. Let's go. But no, put your sandals on. Um, get your coat too. Anybody feel like the man needs a wife in there? Get your stuff together, dude. You're leaving here now. Okay, can we leave, please? I mean, I would be running ahead of the angel going, hurry up, come on, come on, come on. But he's like, Peter, come on, get your stuff, dude, and let's get on out, okay? Peter, okay, goes on out. Don't even know what's clothes. I don't know if this is really happening or not, you know. So, so there's Peter. They prayed and prayed. He's in prison. They prayed and prayed. And he gets released. And it's a great story. Now flip over about three or four pages to Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. Same scenario. This is Paul and Silas. They've been doing what the Lord asked them to do. They also were thrown in prison. I'm going to start in verse 16 of chapter... 
And then I'm going to start on 22 of chapter 16. A mob, and they were sharing their faith as well. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. And the city's officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. I hate this next part. They were beaten severely. And then they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was ordered to make them sure that they didn't escape. So he took no chances and he put them into the inner dungeon. And he clapped their feet into the stocks. I think it's interesting the Bible doesn't just say they, they were beaten with rods. It adds a sentence that says they were severely beaten. Anybody but me ever taken a severe beating? Oh, not with rods. With circumstances. Maybe with words. Maybe the unexpected things that have happened in your life just beat you down. Maybe these sweet young girl yesterday, Monday, I guess it was, 20, early, in early 20s, one and a half year old little baby. When I tell you the bottom has fallen out of that girl's life, that's exactly what I mean. Life as she knows it is no more. And that's going to happen to us. If we walk with the Lord long enough, those times are going to come. I'm sure, we don't have time to read all of Acts, but I'll give you that assignment if I, if, if I need to read all of Acts. I'm sure people were praying for Paul and Silas to be released. We don't have that right in front of us to look at. But they were beaten severely and thrown in. Thrown in the inner dungeon. Like, you do. you're not getting out of this. I want you to see what happens in this unexpected place or unfair place that you might feel as I do for them. Here it is, your word again. Oh, let's see. And so they were thrown into the dungeon and clamped their feet to the stock. 25. About midnight. So that would be like the darkest time ever. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. And other, other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there's your word again. You ought to underline it. Suddenly there was a great earthquake and the prison was shaking to its foundation and all the doors flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. And the jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword and he, to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, don't do it. We are all here. You can go on and read because it talks about that jailer who came to the Lord that night. And he goes on to tell, he went home and told his family. And all of his family were saved and baptized. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. When, when, well, let me not. Let me not. Let me give you, let me give you just a few minutes of time with, at your table. I promise y'all I was going to do this. But before I say anything else, let me just give you a few minutes with your little table tribe here, okay? I want you, you, you to come up, please, with some reasons, some lessons that you can learn in this unexpected place. Maybe, maybe think of, of Peter as well, but certainly with Paul and Silas, some things that were going on. I want you to look and think, talk it out. What are some principles? What are some spiritual insights perhaps that we can glean? What, what are the problems? Maybe some solutions. Do you see God's activity here? How did they respond? Just in maybe one sentence or two, and we'll go from table to table if we have time, but, but just, come, just form, formulate a sentence of what we can learn from this passage that we could apply to our own life. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes, okay? Go.
He's always with you, never leaves you. Nothing is too hard for him. He is still there. He uses circumstances for probably for his will. Uh, this is the overachieving table right here. We, we, got, we got 16 life lessons coming out of this one scripture. The good, his will. And others draw others. Good. Okay, who else? Anybody got a sentence? Yeah, Michelle. promotion and communicating with women is so take your picture with your friends today and then hashtag life together so we can put it on our website and, and put your little sentences on there what we learn in life together and that way people who there's your sign over there we love doing life together there's our little hashtag and that way people who didn't even come can have the benefit of all of these lessons on this table and I want to hear them all but we're going to run out of time everybody can know and then also it's being video today so send your friends to our website, but it is no excuse not to come because there's a video. If y'all stop coming, I'm gonna stop video. I mean, I mean, okay, good. Who about that's a good one? Say it again, Michelle. God performs the unimaginable. 
unimaginable in the unexpected, unexpected. places. God performs the unimaginable, unimaginable in the unexpected places. Oh, that's so good. Anybody else? Yeah, anybody want to share? Table? All right, there in the back. Even in your darkest hour, you can still find joy and comfort through your faith. Oh, that's good. Even in that darkest hour. Did you catch that midnight hour? And, that, and, 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 and it didn't say. And in the midnight hour, Paul and Silas were whining and complaining. Didn't say that. They were praising and worshiping. Anybody else? I, I see. Before we repeat it again, Lori. Even in your darkest hour, you can still find joy and comfort mm. through your faith. That's good. That's good. If you're praising and worshiping. Anybody else? Did I miss a hand? I would have an example. Okay. Years ago, when, we were in, when I lived in Nacogdoches, in Spring Haven, I mean, in Don't Go Baptist Church, um, Christy and I, my, my husband, who's now deceased, we went to Mexico City. We were passing out Mexico City all the time. And so we were passing them out, you know, just we were all in Mexico City, you know. One day we would just sit down and their Bible would be a backpack, and someone just grabbed the backpack and ran off. You know what Jack said? My husband said, Praise God! That is so good. Well, I hope you also saw, and I almost missed this. And see, this is why it's so important to look in this. Around midnight, when they were praising and singing to, to the Lord, and other prisoners were listening. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. How many, and then it said, then suddenly an earthquake, so another miracle took place. The first miracle was the angel appeared, and the other divine invention, the other divine intervention was an, uh, that the earthquake came. And when the earthquake came, all the all of the chains fell off. When I tried to really dig this out to, to see how far, when somebody's in the inner dungeon, does it say about how many people? The best I could find is 100 or so who might be in the inner dungeon, and there would be several levels to get down to there. So when the Bible says all of their chains fell off, so all of those prisoners, and, and then it goes on to say, and all the gates flew open. Did you catch that? Yes. And so here's, here's, here's the question I want to ask you. How many people were praising and worshiping God? Show me how many. Two. How many, how many chains fell off? All. All the chains of all the people and all the doors. Now let me ask you this question. I get, I get Paul and Silas stay. Kind of. Kind of. I'm about to tell you my big mistake that I made. But I kind of get them saying that they've been praising and worshiping and the chains fell off and obviously the Lord moved in, in their heart not to leave. But I've got a question for you. Why are the other criminals in there with them staying? It says all the chains fell off. Two were praising and worshiping. All the chains fell off of all the people, and all the doors came open. And and when the jailer saw this, the jailer was going to kill himself. And this says, but we are all here. How can you explain that? How do you explain the the guy over here who really did the bad thing? Who really did the? Why isn't he picking up his stuff like Debbie Stewart would? The minute that y'all two are praising and worshiping, and I'm just watching, I'm listening, and all of a sudden my chains fall off, and the doors in front of me, I'm like, thank you, two crazy people. I am out of these doors and fast I mean, why did they stay? Why did those people stay? Say, fear. Okay. Any other thoughts? Maybe God moved in their hearts just as well. Good. Okay, that's good too. They felt the presence of the Lord. Anybody else? The physical chain is gone. Yeah. But they felt the freedom there already. Girl, you can be in you can be in captivity and it's free. Ask me how I know. My son is in captivity, but that boy's been set free. Mm -hmm. I know women who are not in captivity. They're out here, but they're they're in captivity. You know what I'm saying? They're free, but they're in captivity. When I go and do prison ministry, I get to meet a lot of women who are in captivity, but they have been set free. I think, it, we, the Bible doesn't say, so we don't want to take too much liberty, but I, I think perhaps as they're looking, because, because of those three words, they were listening. They were listening. I think they saw something in those people. And this is why it's so important for us as Christians, those who are Christ followers, that in the darkest hour of our lifetime, that other people see and hear us, not whining and complaining, but praising and worshiping. Because they'll stick around to find out how is that even possible. What is it that makes her do that? Because we're all in the same place facing the same outcome, and they're not even guilty. At least I'm guilty. i got it coming. Why? What makes a person, when they've been beaten almost to death, beat severely, don't miss that part, 
What makes a person lift their voice to the Lord Jesus and sing in the night scene? There's something about that that makes non-Christians hang around and go, i gotta, I got to find out what that is. And girlfriend, that is your opportunity. That, my friend, is in the unexpected place because it's not about you at all. It's about some other people because the truth is two people were praising and worshiping and everybody got set free. In our darkest hour, I, I don't know what else I said. In our, <laughs> you had to watch the video. It was good, thank you. That was of the Lord. But in our darkest hour, as we lift our voice to the Lord in praise, girls, that's called a sacrifice of praise. Anybody ever done it? Sometimes there's nothing sweeter. When He knows you have been beaten and you're down and you're hurting and it's dark and the outcome, it looks even worse. But yet there you are with your hand raised high to heaven, praising and worshiping. Something about it. Don't miss those opportunities. Don't cut and run, Debbie Stewart, every chance you get to get out of something painful. Let me close with this. I'll just have a few minutes left. Well, oh, let me, a couple of things I wanted to say. I, gosh, I got a whole page of notes here we have not even talked about. Okay, one, one thing is this. We, so there are two scenarios in Acts 12 and 16. Two scenarios. One, you can pray for deliverance and get to leave the situation. Sometimes he does that. Scenario number two, you can pray for deliverance and get to stay in the situation. Okay, God is at work both ways. It's not up to you. You're welcome. <laughs> so two scenarios and two choices. We have two choices. All of this is about listening and all this is about choices. Two choices. You can whine and complain and forfeit your usefulness. Or you can praise and worship and fulfill your destiny. You can whine and complain and forfeit your usefulness. Or you can praise and worship in the darkest hour when you're hurting the worst and fulfill your destiny. It, it might not be your sweet spot. I love to, to be and serve in my sweet spot. This today with y'all, women's ministry, that's my sweet spot. I love that. But sometimes we're not getting to work in our sweet spot. Sometimes there's a scent spot. Are you with me? S-E-N-T. Sometimes the Lord sends us to a place. It's not our sweet spot. Certainly prison wasn't a sweet spot for them, but it was their scent spot. Can you act the same, unlike the Israelites? See, we have perfect examples today. What to do, what not to do. A lot of life lessons in all of the. We looked at three different passages. A lot of life lessons of what, to, what they did that we ought not be doing. Israelites didn't get it right in that scenario. And then we look over here to see what we can apply. Don't always get to be in our sweet spot. And, and, and to, for me, really, the only thing worse than not waiting on God is wishing you had it. Ask me how I know. The only thing worse than not waiting on God to let Him bring the deliverance, let Him bring the release. And in my own family, I've talked to y'all before, I come from a long line of wackadoos, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of addiction, a lot of destructive, rebellious choices that my extended family has made over a very, very long time. Can't do one thing about our, my, my, my heritage, but I can do something about my legacy. But the truth is, one thing that the Lord brought to my attention is I've prayed for their deliverance for many, many years of both of my brothers, of my dad, of a ton of aunts, uncle, just a ton, asking the Lord to, for divine intervention in their life. But what if, what if the Lord allows something painful and severe in your life because they're watching and they're listening? And what if everybody gets set free because two people made the what if what if it was dependent on me? I don't know for sure. What if it was dependent on me? He, well, he, I think he wants to set a whole lot of people free. He's just looking for two people that in the darkest hour will praise him and worship him. Now here's the biggest mistake that I make routinely that the Lord has said, this is going to stop. And I've made every adjustment in my life I can to be sure it doesn't happen again. My tendency, my natural reaction is like in like in Exodus with the Israelites. If I was over here um, thirsty, dying of thirst over here, and I see water, I see water in the distance, a pool of water, I, I would totally, my, 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 my instant reaction is to look at that and totally assume that that is the answer of the Lord. If I'm over here going, oh, so thirsty, Lord, please bring water. But, oh, there's water. I would run over here going, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you just in time. And I get down here, and 
And I'm all happy because the Lord provided the water, but I get over here and I can't drink. And then I get mad again. Anybody not know? But then I'm like, see, I look at something from a distance and assume that's the answer. The same way with them being in prison. If I am in that place and, and I'm praying for divine intervention, praying for God's will, it feels like to me that when a big earthquake comes and all of my chains fall off and all of the doors open in front of me, that feels like a huge divine intervention. And it is. But Debbie, it, what I'm having a hard time with, Debbie, that's not your deliverance. Keep your seat. You, do anybody? Like, I would have assumed, here's the mistake I made. When my chains fell off and the doors opened in front of me, I would have assumed that is my deliverance. The Lord just opened the doors in front of me. But it takes a strong Christian when the Lord opens the doors in front of you for him to say, keep your seat. This ain't your deliverance. But the doors are open. Jay, the door on my chains, I can leave. You know, you, you, when, when a door opens for you to leave a marriage, when a door opens for you to, to change a situation, when we make it happen on our own because it appears, I, sometimes I have to really, I'm really checking and double checking and triple checking everything. Is this, this, you have created a divine intervention moment for me, but is this, is this what I need to move on? Do you understand? Anybody, get, anybody know what I'm talking about? You look at something because something, something miraculous happened. The Lord intervened, but yet he asks ask you to stay there. To stay, not to leave. When you want nothing more than to leave that situation, you want to. They want to get out of prison. Any thoughts about that? Does that does that make sense? Am I, am I explaining it in a way? Of, it happens in my life. Sometimes it's hard to put in words. How do you know the difference? That is a great question. Here's how you know the difference. <laughs> no, you know, because I'm just telling you what I've been in trouble for for quite a while now. When the Lord said this is going to stop. And you can know that you, you know what's coming for Debbie Stewart next? Just what we've talked about today. There'll be a test. There'll be a test to, to see. Do you know the difference when to stay and when to go? If place I go or place I shun, my soul is satisfied with none. But when the Lord directs my way, tis equal joy to go or stay. Let's use God's Word to answer your question. How do you know? The Bible says they were praising and worshiping. The Bible also tells us in other places, and this is why it's so important to keep our face in this Word. Joshua, if you want success, chapter 1, meditate on this day and night. Don't turn to the right or to the left, but stay in this and you'll have success in all that you do. Well, that's one answer for you. The other is this. We know the Bible tells us He inhabits the praise of His people. So if you're praising and worshiping, you're going to be right there with Him. So he's going to be right there letting you know this is the time, letting you stay or go right there. See, here's what I go. As I jump ahead of him, and maybe I wasn't praising and worshiping, and I get over there, and he's going, you better get right back in there where I had you before. I feel like, for me, and it, he might do you a different way. He, you know, We all have different relationships with him. But if he inhabits the praise of his people, and he is right there, and some big divine thing that he just orchestrated in your life happens, it is so easy for us. To just sit there for to, in, in 10 seconds to know his nudging in your spirit. Get up. Kind of like Peter. Peter needed a little more nudging. Wow. He might have, get up, Peter. You get to go, buddy. This is your out. You know, it didn't matter to him. But you get to go. The Lord directs that. And that's what our word shows you. Yara, he instructs, he directs, and he guides. He will show it to you. If you're looking and Exodus taught us if you listen carefully. I don't know of many people that have missed the will of God when they've been looking, asking, and listening carefully. It's one o'clock and I have to let you go. I don't want to. I hope that you'll stay and visit and talk and share around maybe the cafe or around your table if you would like to. There's a, there's a lot to see here. Okay, let's pray. Father, our time goes by so quickly, and only you can take this, all of just what happened, and drive it home in a personal, specific, intentional, divine way in their life. Lord, I pray that you'll nail them. I pray that you'll begin to identify with your finger on their life. This is what you do that's going to stop. I know there are things in our lives we're doing that's keeping us from, from fulfilling our complete destiny and fast-tracking our walk with you and our level of intimacy with you. Lord, I pray that you begin to bring those things to our life. Maybe we've ignored them in the past or just not even seen them. 
Lord, some of us, and we, we, and it is, I, I think, probably not been intentional. Never, n- never wanted purposeful disobedience. But in our ignorance, we disobeyed. And I'm in that group. Lord, forgive us from presumptuous sins. And direct us and show us the way that we are to take. Your word is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path. Thank you for that. We sure love you. Thank you for these sweet girls. In your name I pray. All the girls said. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being a light.